Welcome to the Right to Reason podcast. I'm your host, Robert Stanley. To reason at the right to reason by joining us today yeah thanks for having me yep you can find emerson green's content all over the place it's a podcast named counter apologetics he also has a sub podcast through that called walden pod that's on many outlets but also on youtube and then a youtube channel that you would highly benefit from looking at is t jump he uh debates a ton of people mostly would it be mostly on apologetics t jump uh probably yeah yeah. Moving into politics, there's also some flat earth and conspiracy theory stuff on there, but mostly professors and apologists on uh, reasons to believe in a God and stuff like that. Morality, epistemology. So today we're talking about panpsychism. I was hoping you guys could define that first because I'm one of those people I think that misunderstands it. And I think a lot of the listeners might not know what it is exactly or have concepts about it that are false or maybe conflating other ideas with it. And also it would be good to hear your definition of it because, you know, it's very easy to just start talking past one another if we're really arguing two separate things. I think all three of us find that whenever we talk about morality and we're talking to an apologist or something and, you know, you spend half an hour arguing back and forth and realize, no, that's not the definition I was using. So Emerson, if you don't mind starting us off with your definition of panpsychism and then Tom, if you don't mind following up thereafter, and then I'm just going to try to stay out of you guys' way. Sure. So panpsychism is the view that experience is fundamental and ubiquitous throughout the natural world. So experience is just sort of a fundamental feature of matter. Like if you're already working under the assumptions of physicalism, it actually isn't that much of a step away from physicalism. You just take physicalism and you say that the intrinsic nature of physical matter is experiential rather than some concretely existing non-experiential thing. So it's, it's not that much of a leap, but it happens to solve all these like conceptual problems that physicalism has which is why i go for it cool so uh essentially you would say it's kind of like you're adding a fundamental property to electrons so it's kind of like how they have spin charm all the different properties of electrons you're adding in conscious experience to one as like one of those fundamental properties of matter no no that's um that's a common misconception because people are working usually with this like cartesian conception of matter where um, they basically agree with with Descartes, even though they're not dualists, um, which is that you know matter has a certain nature. But what I'm sort of doing is saying that what we think of as matter is sort of what consciousness looks like from the outside. So the intrinsic nature of matter is experience, and then those physical properties that we always talk about, you know, that's sort of like what matter does or how it behaves or its structure. Um, but yeah, what the thing actually is. So like we already sort of have an example of this with ourselves, I would say, like you know, from the inside, you're a conscious creature, you know, that's what you are at your core. And from the outside, you look like a brain. You know, like if, I, if I study your consciousness, what I'm actually going to find is, you know, electrochemical brain activity. And, uh, but what you actually are, you know, intrinsically is a conscious creature. So panpsychists just kind of think that, you know, that sort of dual aspect character of the brain just kind of pervades the world, in part just because, you know, you're made of the same stuff as everything else in the world so you're saying consciousness is more like uh, an elemental uh force kind of like wood or fire or water kind of like how those uh platonic objects uh they thought there are the different forces that existed in the world and the world is made of these kinds of things and you're saying consciousness is just one of those things it's like one of the fundamental things of the universe that everything is made out of um yeah i guess so it's like <laughs> like sir arthur eddington said that the stuff of the world is mind stuff and you know i guess i kind of go along with that where consciousness is sort of the only concretely existing stuff and what we call matter is a representation of consciousness like schopenhauer thought like there's what the thing is in itself which is consciousness and then there's the representation of the thing in itself which is matter so it's like an ontological monism and sort of an epistemological dualism 
Okay, so everything around me is made of consciousness. This cardboard box is made of consciousness. This this lighter is made of consciousness. This knife is made of consciousness. They're all made of consciousness. Is that that's about right? Yeah, and you might get the wrong idea from that and like think that they're all like subjects of consciousness, but I'm really just saying they're made of the same uh, you know, natural stuff that you're made out of, just arranged differently. Uh, right, and you're saying that stuff is consciousness. Yeah, yeah, basically. So why? Because it doesn't seem like there's any reason to conclude any of these have any aspect of consciousness whatsoever, or that there's any analogous part. It seems like it's the other way around. So like if I said uh, all roses are flowers, but not all flowers are roses, you would be like you are seem to be saying that all flowers are roses. It seems much more reasonable to think that consciousness is a product of matter and not the other way around. Well, you know, that's, you know, where I started off just, you know, being a materialist, thinking that consciousness is produced by matter. And the wording is actually kind of tricky there. I think a lot of people who call themselves materialists are actually like property dualists or something. But um, the reason that I think that consciousness is not an emergent property of matter is because I don't think that materialism or emergentism can really do a good job of explaining why we have phenomenal consciousness in the first place. Which I can go through, but the thing is, like, phenomenal consciousness really needs an explanation. The fact that it's well, like let's start. Let's start be... there. Um, you said materialism can't give an adequate explanation of something. That seems like a argument from incredulity or argument from ignorance, fallacy. One of those two, where he says, uh, "This theory can't explain it. Mine can. Therefore, my theory." Oh, right. Yeah. Well, if that's what I was arguing, you'd be one hundred percent correct. But I'm saying that materialism is inadequate because it can't explain phenomenal consciousness, which I have some arguments for, and those arguments seem to naturally lead to panpsychism once you, you know, actually go through them. But, okay, so um, you have, there's these arguments that uh, materialism doesn't answer, panpsychism does answer, therefore panpsychism. Yeah, panpsychism is a better explanation of phenomenal consciousness than materialism. So it seems like an argument from ignorance or argument from incredulity. You're saying that here is some argument. Uh, materialism can't answer the argument. Panpsychism can answer the argument, therefore panpsychism. Um. Well, we're trying to explain the data here, and panpsychism can explain the data of consciousness. Materialism can't. So, yeah, that's a good argument. Well, so can magical ping pixie leprechauns, but that doesn't mean magical green pixie leprechauns are a good explanation. The fact that you can make up an explanation of something doesn't mean it's actually better than anything else. So the fact that you can explain consciousness one way doesn't mean that that is correct or any evidence to conclude that you're right. It's just a made-up explanation until you have some way to independently verify that made-up explanation outside of your imagination, then it's not evidence of anything. Right. Well, I'm not using magic. Um, you know, it's, I, um, I got to this. Well, just to clarify, that was, that was, that's like, so the, that was an alternative hypothesis that can also explain it. That is, that is a reductio ad absurdum. So it's like saying, if you, if you want to take the argument that materialism can't explain X, but I can make up something else that can explain X and therefore that made up thing is a better supported explanation. Well, then I can do the same thing. And instead of going with consciousness, I can go with magical green pixie leprechauns. So the, the point here is that if that methodology is correct, then we can use it to lead to any ridiculous nonsense we want. And so that that entire methodology is not evidence of anything. I mean, the methodology I'm using is just analytic philosophy and trying to come up with the best explanation of the evidence. My point is that materialism can't explain the evidence, so materialism is ruled out. We have this other hypothesis that does a good job of explaining the evidence. And I mean, that's why I end it. I mean, it's the same way you end up at any other position. Well, no, no. So that's not the same way anyone in science ends up with any position. That's why idealism is rejected by 90-something percent of neurologists, psychologists, cognitive scientists, every scientific field. Uh, it's just not taken seriously, exactly because that's not how scientists come to conclusions. Anybody can make up an explanation to explain anything. That's super easy, infinitely many ways to do it. The difficulty is, is showing that that explanation actually corresponds to something in reality independent of your explanation. So just saying that X can't explain Y, I can make up something else that can explain why. That's not evidence of why. That's evidence of nothing. So that isn't particularly constructive to say that, well, materialism can't explain, I can. That's like saying, uh, well, science can't explain the Big Bang. God can, therefore God. It's a terrible argument. Yeah, so, I mean, let me try to see how you come to believe things, since apparently, like, you're saying that, like, considering evidence and coming up with good explanations of the evidence is not how we arrive at uh, No, I didn't, I didn't say that at all. So, no, evidence is not arguments. Arguments aren't evidence. So those don't count as evidence. Arguments are conceptions. So in order to be evidence, you have to show evidence is that which can differentiate imagination from reality. So for it to count as evidence, you need to take those arguments as a form of abductive reasoning to try and 
inference to the best explanation, which does not count as evidence. And then you see, need some independent way to verify that it actually corresponds to reality independent of your imagination. Just coming up with arguments isn't evidence. So it's, I'm not saying that we don't look at evidence. We definitely do. But what you have isn't evidence. What you have is your imagination. So the way I'm using the word evidence, it's in like a, it's the same as the word data. So it's like what I'm talking about are factors extrinsic to a hypothesis that raise or lower, lower our credence in that hypothesis. So consciousness or phenomenal consciousness is, you know, data extrinsic to our hypotheses, materialism on the one hand, and uh, panpsychism on the other. And well, sure, but that's I'm saying that materialism doesn't do a good job of explaining this data. Uh, again, that's a, still an argument from ignorance or argument from incredulity. It doesn't make a difference what materialism does or doesn't do. It doesn't add or take away any credence to your hypothesis whatsoever. So that isn't in any way ev evidence to reference materialism at all. You would have to show that yours actually has some evidence. And the data doesn't count as evidence. That's, again, uh, abductive reasoning. Abductive reasoning is a form of affirming the consequent fallacy introduced by Charles S. Pierce to logic. You're not allowed to just look at the data post hoc come up with an explanation and then insert the explanation as more likely to be true than another one. Hypotheses don't work that way. Well, I mean, hypotheses do, but you can't, you have to take the hypothesis and then show some way that it's true independent of your imagination for it to count as something more than a hypothesis, which you haven't done. So your hypothesis of consciousness being fundamental is no more supported than the hypothesis of magical pixie leprechauns being fundamental. Well, it is because I have arguments for it and because it's a better explanation of the data, which you can reject that way of approaching things, but it's universally accepted by scientists and philosophers. It's, it's not really problematic. No, again, so I already debunked that. So again, the <laughs> consensus in every academic field is right. idealism is wrong. So they do not use your methodology. They say your methodology is completely wrong. They do assess evidence. They do assess conclusions. The, what you're describing is how you assess hypotheses, which no one cares about until you can verify those hypotheses independently, uh, which is explicitly stated by the reference I just gave, Charles S. Pierce, uh, on uh, affirming the consequent, which is abduction, also post hoc theorization. There's entire classes of fields in philosophy and science that address this explicitly and say, we don't care about your hypotheses until you can independently verify it. So okay, no. So hang on, hang on. Let's talk about independent verification. Cause Go for it. the thing we're talking about right now is a little different from normal scientific or philosophical issues. So phenomenal consciousness has this weird property that it's unobservable. We know it's hundred percent real, obviously. Um, I hope you'd agree with that, but you know, consciousness is real, but it's it's not observable. So it's really, you know, you can't really, you know, verify hypotheses that involve, you know, hypotheses about consciousness. Sure you can. Because it's, well, it's not observable, so you can't. It doesn't need to be. Uh, in science, there's this thing called indirect observation. We can't directly observe the Big Bang, but we can observe the consequences of the Big Bang. We can say, if the Big Bang happened, then we can predict there's going to be this thing called the cosmic microwave background. We predict this, we then build a big telescope to look for it. We find like, oh, that's good evidence of the Big Bang, even though we can't observe the Big Bang. Same with evolution and all kinds of things we have indirect evidence for. So we can right. observe... Uh, there are testable predictions which can have been confirmed about consciousness, which is namely that it's material. Uh, we make the predictions that if consciousness is material, then we can mess with consciousness by doing certain things in the brain, very precise predictions that have been confirmed with very high levels of accuracy. So that does confirm with just like it confirms the Big Bang that the brain and mind are synonymous. That's why 90 something percent of neurologists, cognitive scientists, psychologists are all materialists. Right. So. That is a prediction of monism, actually, and panpsychism is a form of monism. What you just said is no; those aren't predictions. Interesting. Of monism. Yes, they so, are. You said no, the no, brain no, no, and the no, mind. No. You said the brain and the mind are the same thing. No, no, you're not. You're not getting it. That's, so it's not. The, I get to tell you what my theory is, and then I get to make predictions based off that theory. So I can make a theory that there is a round square in my pocket, and if I can make successful testable predictions, that is evidence of a round square. It doesn't make a difference uh, what the actual entailments of the prediction are. So it's like saying, I could predict that uh, the sun will rise tomorrow. Now, obviously, that doesn't entail the sun exists because we could be in the matrix. But we do count that as evidence the sun exists because the evidence is predicated on a theory that the sun is real. So because the theory entails, I believe the sun is real, therefore it will rise tomorrow. If it does, that's evidence the sun is real and that we're not in the matrix, uh, even though it doesn't entail that. So so it's called fallibilism. Doesn't, you don't need 
the entire theory to be entailed by the prediction for it to be evidence of the theory. Um, okay, hang on. It is also a prediction. Let me put it this way. It is also a prediction of panpsychism that if you mess with the brain, you would mess with the human mind. For it to be a prediction, you have to predict it pre as in before we do the experiment. So you'd have to say, given my hypothesis, here is a testable prediction. Do publish a paper doing demonstrating that testable prediction to come true, which I haven't seen any idealist ever do. Well, look, it, it, the hypothesis of panpsychism and the hypothesis of materialism, these are both metaphysical hypotheses. So they both make the same prediction with regards to if we change the brain, uh, we will change the human mind. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So again, prediction is you have to be before. You guys give post predictions. You say, well, there's the evidence all the materialists discovered, and we can explain that too. Anybody can do that. That's exactly what the theists do when they say, oh, look, scientists discover that the the universe is 13.8 billion years old. Ah, we can explain that too because God did it, not evidence. The fact that the evidence is consistent with multiple hypotheses does not mean it's evidence for multiple hypotheses. For it to be a prediction, you need to make the, the, the diction before we know it and then confirm it. And you haven't done that. Materialists have done that. So even if you can post-diction it and say, ah, well, we can explain the same data. Well, it's not evidence for your hypothesis, but it is evidence from the materialist hypothesis because they predicted it. They, they discovered it before uh, we knew it. Whereas you guys didn't. You just post it. Well, panpsychism has been around for a pretty long time. And uh, so? <laughs> well, it's not like you're saying that we just like came up to the scene and then like started post dicting. Um, but um, my, I'm, I'm, my point... Just to clarify, so so Hinduism has been around for a long time, but Hinduism didn't make predictions about uh, DNA. Science did. So so the the time frame in which it came about is irrelevant. What matters is is can you make novel testable predictions and get them right. And then that would be evidence of your hypothesis. But I've never this, seen this whole do that. issue with making novel testable predictions. I mean, we have to come back to the issue of unobservability. So yes, it's true that there are science deals with unobservables all the time. But this is a little different from the normal case of science dealing with unobservables like the Big Bang, or electrons oh. or something. Because those things are postulated to explain data. And like yeah. this is not consciousness is not being postulated to explain data. It is the thing that we're trying to explain. It's not like we knew the Big Bang was a thing. We say, how do we explain this? We had data. We say, how do we explain this? We come up with the Big Bang. There's no difference the other there. way around. There's no difference there. It doesn't make a difference. Like if you have a phenomenon, like you see fossils in the ground, and you say, well, what explains this? Well, evolution does. Then you make other predictions that you haven't, you don't know yet. And if you can confirm those, then that's confirmation of your hypothesis that you made up to explain the data. It makes no difference whether uh, you come up with the hypothesis to explain the data or the data is a prediction of the hypothesis after the fact, it's irrelevant which one comes first, as long as you then make other novel testable predictions. So if you say, here's the data, consciousness, if consciousness is produced by the brain, then we can zap your brain and make changes to your consciousness. And we confirm that, that's evidence that consciousness is material. So that, that hypothesis, first of all, it does make a difference whether the phenomenon itself is unobservable or whether we're postulating unobservables to explain phenomena. Those are two different things. But second of all, the, the thing that you're describing is not really materialism. It's just the general hypothesis that the brain is the mind. And in case you don't no, no, no that's, that's incorrect. That's, that's incorrect. So, panpsychists also believe uh, that Yes, I understand what panpsychists mean. No, no I, so I tried to explain this to you before. I get to tell you what my hypothesis is. And any evidence, any predictions that I make are confirming of my hypothesis, whatever it is. So if, if I say the world is material and I make a testable prediction and it gets right, then that's evidence the world's material. It does not matter if it could fit into your hypothesis. It makes no difference at all. My theory could be anything. It could be I have a round square, like a logical contradiction in my pocket. If that is my theory and I make a prediction, a novel testable prediction that gets that is correct, that's evidence of my hypothesis. So it makes no difference what my hypothesis is, I get to tell you what it is. And then if I can make testable predictions and you don't, then my hypothesis has evidence and yours doesn't. So if a materialist makes a prediction based on materialism, that's evidence of materialism and not evidence of dualism, regardless of what the prediction is. Okay, what was their prediction specifically that they made? Their, their whole thing that they were testing was the brain and the mind. Like that's yes. the hypothesis that they were testing. Yes. And what I'm saying is that basic thesis is a part of many theories of consciousness. It's not just uh, yes. part of materialism. Yes, that's true. Just like the Big Bang is a part of many theories of theism, also not evidence of theism. So again, the fact that you can post hoc explain the data isn't evidence of your hypothesis. It's not post hoc. I, I don't know what to tell you, man. Like this is not... You keep who, bringing up who, all these Who made the predictions? With... Who did the research? Who's, who wrote the papers? It was all materialists. 
Materialists I, I are the ones I doing all the work in neurology. That. They're That's the ones not making true. 90% of like neuroscientists or neurologists, cognitive scientists, psychologists, all materialists. Uh, there's a interview from Seth, Seth something, Seth Andrews and Seth. Julian Mussolino specifically talking about the consensus in this field, why no one's an idealist. No one thinks there's this consciousness stuff there. No, the consensus is that that's wrong. Everyone in the field doing the work, making the predictions are materialists. Yeah. So again, the neuros, the data of neuroscience First of all, scientists are not philosophers. They're not. They're often not very good philosophers, and this is a philosophical issue. This is not a scientific issue. Like the uh, data of neuroscience are compatible with different views, and I can also appeal to authorities here and point out that two of the greatest neuroscientists alive right now are panpsychists. Oh. Like two of the leading, uh, you know, um, what well, you, you can't actually theory, neuroscientific it, theories of consciousness are global workspace theory and integrated uh, information theory. Integrated so, so, information wait, wait, just, theory just implies clarify. panpsychism. So the consensus overrides all anecdotes of particular authority. So the consensus wins. And the consensus is yeah, overwhelming. Yeah, but this, is not, this is not expert consensus. This is consensus of what neuroscientists think about philosophy of mind. They're that's, not philosophers of mind. No, no, no. The philosophy of mind is garbage. It has nothing to do with reality. It's just imaginary That's what we've philosophy. been talking about this whole time. No, I've been talking about reality and physics neuroscience, the actual fields that are actual authorities on this, so not philosophers I. of you mind. So have I. You just haven't really been Philosophers of what mind I'm are saying. also philosophers of mind are also majority physicalists too, by the way, but even so, philosophers of mind are not the relevant experts in this field. Neurologists are. Again, this is a metaphysical issue. This is not a neuroscientific issue. Neuroscience is just dealing with different questions than the ones that we're talking about. Uh, nope, that's incorrect. So in order to get to <laughs> metaphysics or ontology about what reality consists of, you need some way to show that your ideas are conformed to reality and aren't just in your head. So that's why I mentioned at the beginning, evidence is that which can differentiate imagination from reality. Philosophers of mind can't differentiate a thing. They're just a bunch of imaginary ideas that never go beyond being imaginary, which is why they aren't relevant experts. You need someone who can do that, and the ones who can do that are the neurologists. I was thinking uh, this might be a good part where I could chime in and try to offer something here that I, I could be wrong, but I like we finally got to that part where you might be talking past each other. I was afraid it would be in the definition, but you guys seem to agree primarily there. But Emerson seems to be looking at this from a philosophical point of view, while Tom seems to be looking at this from more of a scientific point of view. And and Tom is saying, I need some evidence for this or some kind of predictive power for me to accept it scientifically. And Emerson's saying, well, this is a philosophical argument. But at the same time, in philosophy, we still have ways to present the argument that you might refer to as evidence. So, I mean, it would still have a if this, then that, or a number of other ways of to trying to prove your point. Do you have something like that, Emerson, that you would say this would be a sufficient philosophical argument? Well, I don't actually want to go there just yet. So first, I want to bring up the point, because in epistemology, the whole, whole point of what evidence is, is that which can differentiate imagination from reality, because we can all make up different hypotheses. And until you can provide a methodology that can accurately differentiate which ones are real and which ones are imaginary, then you have no evidence of all, at all, none. So uh, just presenting arguments doesn't count as evidence unless you can show that the methodology you're using to come up with those arguments can differentiate imagination from reality. And that's where he would need to start before he presented the arguments. How would, now, now I feel like I'm debating you, but just in terms of making a philosophical argument, I don't know how we would just, uh, I don't know, what's a good example, argue deontology versus utilitarianism or virtue ethics. You know what I mean? Like in that in that moment, you are trying to argue your best form of ethics. But if it was just in philosophy and not in science, which by the way, I agree with you, Tom, <laughs> and I disagree with Emerson, but in a philosophical, I don't know how, if I was well, trying the, to make that argument, the, I could meet your standard well, no, the thing is you say, well, you can't. There's nothing you can do. There's, It's not going to ever be as credible as any type of materialism. Materialism wins by default. And then this is just a fun hypothesis we like to take. think is interesting, but it'll never be as serious as materialism. That would be the admission you would need to make in order to move forward, unless you could provide some way to make it as serious as materialism. So, so the point I'm trying to illustrate here is that materialism is the serious position. It's the only academic serious position. Idealism isn't. It's not even taken seriously because of this criterion that they can't provide a way to differentiate imagination from reality. Materialism can. It works very well at this. And that's why it's not taken seriously in any academic field. I, I agree and then after, 100% after you, with all that. After you, after you admit that, then, it, then we can go into the fun philosophical arguments that I can show why they're equally as explainable under materialism or better explained under materialism. But the first thing that you need to show is that, yeah, this isn't this 
Idealism isn't the one taken seriously in academia. It's not the serious philosophical or scientific position materialism is. It's the one that's actually supported because it actually has this extra thing that can differentiate imagination from reality. It provides that, whereas idealism doesn't provide that. And that's that's why materialism has a significant oh, advantage. I see your point. So like if I was gonna if I was gonna argue uh, once again, I, I wanna argue that Aristotle had it right all along, right? And then you say, Well, you have to show that that's not just in your mind. That's not imagination. That's that's the virtue ethics is a reality. And I said, Well, I don't know how I can meet that goal. We're having a philosophical conversation. And then you say, Well, first you have to say that it doesn't exist, and then we can talk about it as a philosophical possibility. I would actually at that point concede and say, I don't know if it does or not, but here's my here's my theory, you know, or here's Aristotle's theory. Let's address it conceptually. I, I would think that oh, yeah, would be sure. a fair argument. Or ethics where there's no uh, better alternative hypothesis that actually does have supported evidence. Yeah, that, that would be perfectly fine. But in the case of consciousness, there is a better alternative hypothesis with tons of supporting evidence. And that's why it's not fine. Would both of you agree that this could be discussed at least conceptually? Sure. Do you have yeah, a, con obviously. a conceptual argument that would defend panpsychism? Yeah, well, I said at the outset, materialism can't explain why phenomenal consciousness exists, and it's the most certainly known natural phenomenon, so that's kind of a problem. But the uh, the issue, I think, between me and Tom is that Tom imagines himself to be on the side of science, and I'm on the side of philosophy, and that's just, we're, we're both doing philosophy, it's just one of us doesn't realize it. Well, no, no, I'm on the side of philosophy, too. Everyone is against you in every academic field. That's not true. But uh, also, what do you I mean don't mean care. <laughs> Bill surveys paper, like physics polls, like everyone in every academic field says idealism is wrong. It's a, it's like a two to five percent max in any academic field of all of also, the surveys in every I, fund. I'm not, why do you keep saying idealism? Uh, well, just the idea that consciousness is fundamental. I'm grouping panpsychism and oh, into okay. idealism. But so okay. yeah, that would be incorrect. Technically, you're panpsychist, but idealism is more understood term. So. It is slightly different. I mean, actually, it's it's a lot different. But that's okay. right. But the point is, is that idealism is a much more common view than panpsychism. Panpsychism is an even more minority view than idealism. And so, if I group them together, then even if I group them together, it's still in the single digit percentages. So then, if I want to just talk about panpsychism, where it's in like the several dozen people category, that's even less significant. So, the the point here is that that view is a minority in every academic field. It's not taken seriously exactly for the reason I just expressed. You can't I, I differentiate imagination from reality. True. I don't Phil think it's not taken seriously. Well, no, no, no. I'm saying, first of all, it's not as much of a minority position as you're making it sound. It's not a dozen people. And it's it's also like, a, it's got a long history with pretty well-known thinkers. The, the problem that I see with what you're saying with just appealing to, quote unquote, expert consensus, which is is, I don't think, an accurate way of characterizing what you're doing here is that we could just go back into a different time you know pretty recent history and the opposite would have been true i mean these things are basically just academic fads that like like idealism was one yeah yeah we could fashion. go back where we materialism go back, was once in fact uh, like, and we could go back in time fashions. where people were more ignorant than they are today and didn't have the same information they had today yes and then they would possibly be justified when they had less information to come to a different conclusion sure okay well these are, I mean, I, I feel like I'm just repeating myself, but we, we just don't see eye to eye on like philosophy of science or like what philosophy is or what science is. Like the things that were about like prediction and postdiction and that sort of thing. Like, I think that you have. Well, a, I just gave a, straight, a, straight up definitions unusual... from the Stanford Encyclopedia on all of those. So if you disagree with those, that's kind of a problem. So. Uh, post hoc um, theorization, you Google it. Claude okay. Shannon, ad abduction reasoning, like it's literally the thing I, I gave you the references on these because i'm reading them right now okay so do you want to move on to the conceptual arguments sure i think you've crushed you enough on that one that topic. <laughs> i think you just don't understand what you're doing i, I feel like you just don't know i, I mean yeah, like, again i gave you all the references so you can check everything i just said to show i'm right like feel free it's just the points that you're choosing to argue on are just like they're not points that I've ever had to argue before because they're just universally understood among philosophers. And it's just like, again, I gave you all the references I, to prove I'm right. You can literally check them one by one. Okay. Okay. So can, so could, do you want to talk about Go why you're a physicalist? Uh, why? Cause all the evidence indicates physicalism. Oh, okay. I hadn't realized that. Okay. So, um, so, but you said that you want, I believe you said novel testable predictions. Oh, I said, and, uh, uh, a way to differentiate imagination from reality. The way I use is novel testable prediction. If you have a different way, that'd be great. 
Okay, so what are so other than these uh, predictions that the mind and the human brain, you know, the human mind and the human brain are basically the same thing. Um, you know, is there anything else other than that that makes you a physicalist? Um, what I mean, like all of the prediction is in every academic field related to neurology, cognitive science. Why are you a mind, physicalist? What? what what has convinced you that physicalism is true? It's the only theory that makes novel testable predictions, and it's made all of them. What are those novel testable predictions? Uh, everything from geology to cosmology to physics to neuroscience, everything, everything in science is based on novel testable predictions, like the entire field of science. Geology? What are you talking about? I'm a physicalist, not just for the reason of just the mind. I'm a physicalist because everything in every field, every testable prediction, not just related to the mind, but related to everything in the world is predicated on the theory of this is physical stuff and it works. So, so every single field, like physics and cosmology and geology and biology, they all make testable predictions that are all confirmed, all based on the idea of physicalism uh, and materialism, and they work. And then, then we can then infer that to the mind and say, well, the mind, same pattern, same pattern in neurology. All the testable predictions are made by physicalists. All of them are predicated on the mind and the brain are the same. They all work. It's the only one that works. So that's why I'm a physicalist. So, so all of the evidence in every field Okay, well, we're we're talking about philosophy of mind, and I'm saying f I'm a physicalist in this in the same very broad sense that you just defined the term. I mean, like, what? The, I don't know. Again, it just feels like you don't know the words that you're using. Like, no, physicalism, physicalism is the idea that the the mind is the brain, and that they're all just physical yes, processes, and that's it. Exactly. And so, but so I didn't, no, 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 no. Way, so, yeah. so what I did was I said that I am a physicalist in that I think the mind is the brain, not only because of the work in neurology, but also because of every other field. We've only ever discovered material things. They're the only ones that make testable predictions. Like if, if idealism could make other kinds of testable predictions in other fields and those would work, then it would be reasonable to infer that maybe the mind is this other kind of stuff that makes predictions in these other fields. It doesn't ever do that. The only thing that ever works in any field is the physicalist materialist position. And so it's reasonable to infer that it applies to every field because it's the only one that works in any field. Okay, so in your mind, how would, how would the science of geology change if panpsychism were true? That would be up to you. Like, oh, you would have to say, it if wouldn't my... change. It wouldn't change. I, again, okay, so you I have no evidence. I'm, gl I'm glad you have no evidence. But if you had, like, I'm a panpsychist and I'm going to make a prediction that no one knows yet based on my theory of panpsychism, and then you discover it, that would be evidence of panpsychism. Okay, but again, just the, the, uh, the sciences that you're making reference to do not really establish physicalism in the way that you seem to think. Uh, I've like, already addressed this. So, so physicalism is established. If I make any testable prediction we don't know yet, and it's right, it establishes physicalism. It doesn't make a difference if you can explain it or not. So, so it doesn't. It doesn't need to uh, falsify idealism to be evidence of physicalism. It's not how yeah, I'm not works. saying it needs to do that. I, I just there's some kind of disconnect here over how science works or how philosophy works. I can't quite put my finger on where it is exactly. But, what, what, I mean, what, like, what is the problem you're, here? You're so talking... science and philosophy work on novel testable predictions as a method to differentiate imagination from reality. That's how it works. That is that is literally how it works. We say, I have an idea, a hypothesis. Then we need some independent way of verification. And that independent way of verification, when it's confirmed, is evidence of the hypothesis. That's literally how it works. This is literally what it says in the definition of abductive reasoning presented by Claude Shannon, which is affirming the consequent and why the hypothesis methodology you're using fails and is rejected by the consensus in every field yeah i so, just I, you're misrepresenting the consensus you're misrepresenting what? how philosophers think stanford I, I encyclopedia don't... philosophy uh the phil surveys paper the uh, a poll of recent attitudes in physics i'm not misrepresenting i just gave you the sources that literally prove they're correct what like you can't just say i'm misrepresenting anything when i literally give you the sources that prove i'm correct okay I mean, I just, I don't feel like we're getting anywhere here. I, this is not like a normal conversation about, like, I talk to physicalists all the time. And this is not like the normal okay. conversation that I have with physicalists. Like, that's nice. I, this is not. <laughs> is it, is it I possible? Mean, like, I, I don't mean to. Emerson uh, and Tom, is it possible that you guys are talking about both science on one end and philosophy on the other end? No. And attempting to conflate the two? No, I'm covering both. So I, I know exactly what he's saying. I know exactly why it's wrong. And I've explained it like four times now. And he says, oh, you don't understand science. You're misrepresenting science. When I literally provide the sources, I'm reading the science. So this is the problem that idealists make is that they think that they don't understand epistemology. They straight up just don't understand uh, the, the closure principle or Nozick's 
uh, I forget what Nozick's principle is on the same topic. They think that because you can explain the data in multiple ways, that's evidence of your hypothesis. It's not, not how evidence works. Um, yeah, that's not what I'm saying. Okay, what are you saying? I've explained it like four times, and you're still not your, your argument from ignorance that, that phys- it's not physicalism an argument can't from explain. You're using these like you're using these like logical fallacies from like YouTube videos or something, and acting like that's how. Okay, how, like, uh, you literally said materialism cannot explain it. There, my <laughs> hypothesis can. Therefore, my hypothesis. That's literally what you said. Those are no, your words. I actually, that's that's not. I mean, like I, I you said, said it three that times. I have arguments against materialism that work yes. as arguments for panpsychism. We yes. did not even get into those because you're wait, wait, wait. So, 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 about many different issues. So these arguments, arguments are essentially here is something that your hypothesis can't explain that my can. That, that's what the argument is. That's what an argument is. It's saying here is something that your hypothesis can't explain that mine can. On its own, it's nothing but an argument from ignorance. So saying okay. that when we, when we have a hypothesis and it can't explain some of the data, we revise the hypothesis or come up with a new one that can. That's the ordinary progression, and that's what I did. Uh, no, it's it's that's the ordinary progression of coming up with the hypothesis. Then you need to independently verify it, which is the part that you can't do. So making yeah, up an explanation is unobservable. It makes no sense. So, so saying that you can't provide evidence for your hypothesis is just admitting you can't you have provide no evidence. evidence for yours. The fact that you think just that you've provided evidence, you have not provided evidence. Novel test for predictions. materialism. Well, sorry, I'm, let me rephrase that. Let me rephrase that. You've provided things that are evidence for materialism and are equally evidence for other points of view. And that's like, that's the fallacy that the idealists <laughs> always make that is completely wrong. That is, that's the what I mentioned before, the closure principle and Nozick's whatever principle. That's literally what it's addressing. Yes, so, I, I heard you the first few times. What so, I'm saying so that is that... is wrong. The, that is the demonstrably things, wrong. Oh my God. The thing that you're pointing to as a prediction is not more expected on materialism than it is on other No, that, that's that's the exact fallacy that I keep bringing up. That it's isn't how fallacy. evidence works. It's fucking Bayesian reasoning. No, no, no. no. That, <laughs> that's not how Bayesian reasoning works either. Bayesian reason also works against idealism because it's also never worked. So the the whole point here is that that methodology that is the foundation of entire of all idealism is that, well, uh, just because it's a prediction it can be explained on multiple hypotheses doesn't you make it equal evidence for multiple hypotheses. You think that's the reason people are idealists? Again, I'm not um, an idealist, but the reason you're like that's the that's the reason idealist? for all idealism. That's not the reason for all idealism. The point is like these different views are empirically equivalent and it's really hard to distinguish between them. So we have to go to these conceptual distinctions because like they're empirically equivalent because the thing we're trying to explain, this is unique to all scientific all right, let me, views. Let the let me phenomenon try to this is way. unobservable. Let me try to explain it this way. So let's say, what is the best hypothesis of what caused a hurricane? Was it a cup or a magical leprechaun? Like, which would be a better explanation of the hurricane? The plastic cup or a magical leprechaun? You know, these analogies are, are not as helpful as you seem to think they okay. are. They're, they're not try really... To, try to answer, like, would, like it's a genuine question. It's like, a how... stupid question. It, it, I mean, this is exposing that you don't really understand the subject at hand. Like, it hasn't exposed any, they haven't followed it through, so you can't. You don't have no idea. You just have to head up your ass. So answer the question: Which one is a better explanation of the hurricane? We have we have a hurricane. Two, there's only two possibilities logically in this analogy. It was caused by a plastic cup or a magical leprechaun. Which one is the better explanation? I, I'm not answering that. It's it, it neither. Neither. It's, it's, in this analogy, it's, I'm not answering one of those two. It has to be one of these two. I would I would think so, the cup. I mean, I, I get why you you don't want to answer Emerson because it you know. He, he's, it's, it's like a, a setup analogy, question. but but obviously one exists and one requires more. Bingo! Like, it makes the exactly. answer harder to answer. I would, I would. So, that's okay. how I would answer. So but. how the fuck is that analogous to what we're talking about? So Neither so the, the point here is that magic. yeah yeah that was literally the follow up to the analogy. So so that was the the next part that you would explain after it. So the reason that the cup is a better explanation is that we have evidence it exists. Like it's literally a thing in the world, independent of imagination, leprechauns aren't. And the fact that they're, well, we don't know anything about leprechauns, therefore they could explain uh, a hurricane if they have magical powers, maybe, sure. That isn't evidence of anything. It's just a hypothesis you made up in your head. So the only thing that actually counts is something that you can show exists independent of your imagination in reality first, like the cup. And we can do that with matter. We can't do that with consciousness. It's like a, the okay, analogy again, I used earlier okay. in the, in the, in the beginning of... Panpsychists think that uh, matter exists, okay? There is a mind in And it's made of reality, consciousness, which is wrong. And the, <laughs> so so that's, that's what I said at the okay, beginning. Tom, You're hey, confused. Tom, how do you, how do you uh, know that I'm conscious? Uh, I, with certainty, I don't. Because I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of matter. I'm a bit yes. of conscious matter. Yes. Okay, so we know here in this case that matter is conscious. That matter yep. in some cases is consciousness. So how yep. exactly do you go about verifying that? Uh, I ask you questions to see if you can have an analogous experience to or analogous responses to mine. 
But you can't observe my experience, though, right? In the same Indirect way observation. With- I don't need to. So I don't need to. I don't need to observe the Big Bang to know the Big Bang is there. I don't need to observe your consciousness to know you're conscious. Right, but you know that you're conscious, right? Yep. Okay, and I don't know that you're conscious. So, again, th- there's just no way to verify this. And it's different from postulating. I, wait, I just gave um, you one. It's different from postulating something that happened, you know, or some, like, uh, you know, natural phenomenon to explain some data that we can observe. N- right now we're trying... Well, because in one case, we postulate something in order to explain something that we can observe. It's an interpretation or an explanation. It makes no difference. So, so that you haven't explained an anything. So I say, if you I know, want to know... The thing I like some... best about you is that you're a great listener and you're very teachable. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. So going back, uh, that doesn't make a difference. You've explained no difference whatsoever. You just showed you don't understand epistemology. So if I say, I want to explain, I want to know if something is conscious, anything, there's two ways to do it, particularism and methodism. Particularism, I can start with a particular thing and say anything that has the same qualities is conscious. Or methodism, I can come up with a methodology to test if it has these properties and apply the method. So I can say, given I'm conscious, I can start with this particular example, and then I can build a method around that particular thing and say, well, anything that has the same analogous properties is conscious. Does that give me certainty? Can I observe your consciousness directly? No. Do I need to? No. I can still know you're conscious because I, you pass the methodological test. I don't need to know with certainty. To know. You don't need certainty for knowledge. So yes, I can know that you are conscious just by asking you questions and seeing if you're you are analogous to my consciousness. Just like I can know the Big Bang happened without actually observing the Big Bang. Those are exactly the same. It makes no difference which one, whether you postulate the theory to explain the data or you make a theory or the you see the data and then make a theory to explain it. it. Makes no difference. Okay, so just to come back to this point, I've had many conversations with many physicalists and they are they don't make the same points that Tom is making. This is like is this no one argument? says this, no one thinks no, I'm j- I'm just letting listeners know that this is not the normal defense of physicalism or a good defense of physicalism. No, it's a great defense. I've just crushed you. So could you actually like address what I said then? Like if you think it's bad, address what I said. I don't think you understand the view. I don't, I, I don't think you care what you think. Approach. Address what I said. Like if you can't address my argument, then you can't say, Oh, well, I, you're you're ignorant of how to address my argument, therefore it fails. Like, no, I just crushed you and you can't address it. So address it. <laughs> If you can't address it, you lose. I mean, you crushed me in the sense that a pigeon thinks it crushed someone when they're okay, playing Okay, so chess. then address what I said. Like, if you think it's wrong, address what I said. I, you know, I've tried a few different times. You keep interrupting me. You keep not listening. It's kind of frustrating. Okay, oh, then I go. Address what I said. Go. <laughs> well, I mean, which part? I, I, I just, like, there's nothing to grab onto. Uh, well, plenty of things for me to grab onto. So, again, you keep making this argument that I can't know your conscious... I haven't made conscious... an argument. I haven't gotten to that point yet. <laughs> You, you just keep you keep why, saying why are you interrupting like, so you don't need a literal argument to be making an argument so yeah you are making an argument you, you are saying that oh i can't know you're conscious because i can't literally obje- observe your consciousness which no i prove that false i can know your conscious just fine without observing your consciousness directly okay again that was one step in yes. a multi-step argument that i never got to the end of and i'm frankly losing interest in getting to the end of the point i, I mean like okay so again, i proved that not, point not, wrong no, you didn't. <laughs> you said I like, couldn't know you're conscious, and I just, I, I just said did. consciousness is not observable, and then you went off yes. on like, yeah, and again, consciousness remains unobservable despite you crushing me. <laughs> can I, can I so, jump so in? So I, I can know you're conscious without observing consciousness. Let me jump in real quick just before we lose you guys, because I can see this is going downhill a little bit. But I, there's something that's been driving me crazy this whole this whole conversation, and I feel like Emerson could prove his argument, but you would. I would think you would need to be able to show consciousness existing without a brain, like you, just some evidence of that. Would you at least call that a fair requirement? How would anyone show sure. that consciousness exists anywhere because it's unobservable? Again, this is a unique Indirect problem. observation. I, gave, I already answered that. Give novel testable predictions. Anything you want. Go. Okay. But the thing is, you can't observe experience, so you can't actually verify that it's not over there or it is for sure remember, over remember. there. You can again, okay, listen, you can make an inference. You can make a I also believe that you're conscious, Tom, and I recognize that consciousness is unobservable. Okay. I'm inferring that you're conscious, and it's a good inference. But it doesn't change the basic fact that experience is unobservable. So I can't demonstrate that consciousness is somewhere over there, just like you can't demonstrate conclusively that I'm conscious. And again, like you said, you don't need certainty to like infer rationally that someone else is, co- is conscious. Wait, wait, but you don't need certainty to know. You, you don't need certainty to have knowledge. Yes, agreed. So, so, uh, so it's not just to infer. It's like to have the conclusion, I know that you're conscious and I know that you're made of matter. I don't need certainty for either of those things. Right. So, so demonstrating that 
So what Robert is saying is like, I need to show that consciousness exists somewhere outside of a brain. And what I'm saying is I can't do that directly because it's not the same thing as observing like an atom or something Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. I totally okay? agree there. But, the, but you so, could do it indirectly. So, so, so the thing that we have to do to get there no. is we have to reason our way there. So, so you could do it indirectly, like all the things I mentioned, like it's how we do it indirectly for materialism, that those would work fine. But even if you couldn't do it indirectly, you would still need to provide some way that you can differentiate imagination from reality. If you're, do you think these arguments can do that? That would be your, okay, your what, position. What I'm trying to impress upon you is that you have not met these ludicrous standards that you've set for yes. me. You have, not, you have not met them either. So my standard is novel testable predictions. Has yeah, science made that. novel testable predictions? What? Yes, you say that, but as I've explained, yeah. science and materialism are not the same things. We have different words for them because they're different ideas. Uh, are the mater are the scientists who are making predictions materialists and making predictions based off of materialism? I don't care what their personal beliefs are. The point is, like, do the predictions... That, that's what a prediction is. So, so you have a personal belief, you have a hypothesis, and then you make a prediction off of the hypothesis, and then you confirm it. There are materialists who have a position, and then based off of that position, they make a hypothesis and a prediction, and it's confirmed. That's literally what I'm asking for from you. Okay, so, literally so, has again, been I, I, oh God. so I, the materialists that you're referring to were in a context where pretty much everyone was a dualist. So they thought, well, I don't think that we have this immaterial soul. So, they, so uh, you know, a consequence of that would be that if you change the brain, then you change the mind. You know, Wait, like, du you, dualists can't... Like, fuck you, you, God, you, said, you said that... I can't meet the standard that I'm holding you to. That's what you said, right? Can I finish my fucking point, please? No, because this is this okay. was the. I said you said I cannot meet the standard that I asked of you. And so I sometimes, say, yes, I can. Tom, chains of reasoning take longer than like five seconds. So I was going to come back around to that. Okay, but please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, because I was lost in what you were saying. I, I couldn't. I can't find the relevance there. So yes. I, I can. So I, I can understand that standard. you can't find the relevance there. I've, I'm, pr I'm yeah, that's very what I'm asking aware for. that you can't find the relevance there. Yes, that's what I'm asking. So, so here's here's the question we're at. You said I can't meet my own standard. My standard is novel testable predictions. You can make a hypothesis, whatever you want, any novel test predictions you want. If they're confirmed, that's evidence. My standard, scientifically, materialism has met that. So I can meet my standard that I'm holding you to. Where is your objection? Okay, so this this chain of reasoning is going to take longer than 10 seconds. So just try to try to... Hang on. So the materialists that you're referring to that apparently I'm not allowed to reference because they were materialists in like, you know, the 19th and 20th centuries. And they were they were in a context of dualism. And they thought, well, I don't know if, if we have this immaterial soul. And they in, you know, a, a, a prediction of that view that the brain and the mind are the same thing. There's not this extra stuff is that you change the brain and you change the mind. So that prediction is extremely borne out. You know, like it's very well supported that you change the brain and you change the mind. So you're right, those people were mostly materialists, but they were also mostly atomists. So the fact that, you know, you change the brain, you change the mind is not really, you know, good evidence for atomism. And it's not post-diction if you like go back and say, okay, I'm still a materialist even though I'm not an atomist anymore. Now I believe in some kind of like field ontology or something. But the point is you can still claim, you know, that like, okay, the, the whole, the, the basic point is just that the brain is the mind Okay, but even though the materialism of the 19th century is nothing like the materialism of the 21st century, like literally nothing like it, that is, that's fine. You know, like I'm not holding that against you, okay? But like the point is their hypothesis specifically when you isolate it is that the human brain and the human mind are the same thing, okay? But there are many different versions of materialism that are, you know, compatible with that basic view. And like, uh, you know, the same goes for panpsychism. So you just because the people who made the prediction were atomist materialists doesn't mean that you have to be an atomist materialist or else you're guilty of post diction or some something like that like the point is that their specific hypothesis was not actually you know atomist materialism it was the very specific claim that the brain and the mind are the same thing so i'm still not yeah i was right where none of that actually answered my question so uh, it, it does answer your question i no my question what <laughs> you you said that I can't meet my standard to which I'm yes. holding you to. My you standard is novel testable predictions. You're, you're guilty of post-diction. No, no, no. So, so you're you're, way is not in any way post-diction. That's what happened was is they made new novel testable predictions for waves that defeated atoms. And so that 
those new novel testable predictions confirmed this new hypothesis. So if, if you have new novel testable predictions that would confirm idealism or pan, panpsychism, that'd be great. That's great evidence, like it would be for wave theory. So I'm not postdicting anything when I adopt wave theory. I'm adopting the new novel testable predictions because those work. You don't believe in the same theory of mind, the same metaphysics, as the people who made those novel testable predictions way back when. Right. I, I believe in the ones that have made the new novel testable predictions. It's the same thing. It's just the brain what? is the mind. I mean, like, it's the same thing, like, the, the basic, and again, there are, one of the leading neuroscientific theories, which is integrated information theory, implies panpsychism. No, There's no, some novel... It's yeah. not, not one of the leading ones, but... Um, yeah, it is. And plus, it leads to novel testable predictions. It does? It what, what, are, what are those? I, I what are those? What? Okay, integrated information theory. No, I know, I know what, theory. I know what it is. Giulio Cinoni is the guy who wrote it. What testable predictions does it make? I mean, like, integrated information theory does make novel testable predictions. It, it makes I'm predictions what? about, it makes predictions, Tom, about, for instance, like people who are in comas. Like, we, we can try to figure out whether or not they're conscious. And when they come out of the coma, we can see if they were, in fact, conscious based on, you know, the uh, the criteria that Tononi has, has developed. It is testable. And, and I mean,